I I really really love and appreciate movies that are written in ways where everything fits like a uh, part of a puzzle. And this mm-hmm. is a film where watching it recently because I hadn't seen it in a while, I was able to pick up on so much more of just how everything connected and how everything was like purposeful, especially in terms of like the thematic elements because you got the main character who says that he wants to live his life through these other beings sort of thing, like the the um, mm-hmm. the puppets that he has. He's able to express himself more in that way. And then once he's in John Malkovich's body and controlling him, we see that he's much more confident and that he's actually able to talk to Catherine Keener's character. He's actually able to talk to her and communicate with her in a way that's not like complete cringe like the first half of the movie <laughs> where he's like yeah. the most awkward incel type ever right yeah and then you get to the elements like i i love that it's a puppeteer that winds up being able to control john malkovich like that makes sense Mm -hmm. because he's so used to manipulating other bodies already that that works logistically for this fantastical idea this this weird concept that they've created that fits there's also if you think about i think her name's maxine uh, Catherine Keener's character. Yeah. If you think about yeah. her character and her motivations, she's figuratively puppeteering other people. Like everything is about yeah. controlling and puppeteering. She gets off on it. And we we get that from her character before there's even any element of like John Malkovich portal sort of thing. Like she loves manipulating and controlling. Like she when they meet in the bar and she's like Oh, you just have to admit it. You, like you want to fuck my tits, and then she finally gets him to admit it, and she's like, "Yeah, not happening." And she just loves that she can control him. That's all she wants, mm-hmm. and that plays into her motivation of like her loving the idea of being able to control more than one person simultaneously. It's like, oh, two people looking at me and loving me through the same set of eyes, and then she's like, "Oh yeah, well, I can control." John Cusack and he can control John Malkovich and I can control everything. And so in a way she's her own kind of puppeteer. And and I, I yeah. just I think it's brilliant and really thoughtful. There's so many parts of the movie that you almost feel are throwaway lines. And we get asked this question quite a lot, or I do anyway. I, I know we've been asked this on the podcast before, about like what is the difference between good and bad reincorporation? And to that, I would say Mm. that good reincorporation is something that you don't expect will come back later. And when it comes back, you're like, okay, that that fits and that makes sense. And so there's throwaway, supposedly, seemingly throwaway lines in this film that do come back later. Like when John Cusack is saying, consciousness is a terrible curse. I think I feel I suffer. And the curse of being conscious is what he is actually subjected to at the end of the film he's limited to just purely consciousness and nothing else so it's like his character Mm. wasn't really appreciating not just him being consciousness but him having i guess agency and control over what he was doing whereas at the end Mm. of the film he's limited to just purely consciousness and nothing else uh there's the line Mm. about the uh chimpanzee character and they were just saying like, oh, yeah, he's got like post-traumatic stress disorder or whatever. And you think it's just like one of those like tiny funny things. But then it actually plays into the plot and we get the chimp flashback. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, oh, we're actually seeing what gave him <laughs> PTSD. And it, you know, he winds up freeing uh, Cameron Diaz's character. And so everything is just like, it's so tight. It's so neat. It's just nothing is wasted. And I, I love scripts yeah. like that. I love movies like that. It's just, I, I appreciate it so much. There's there's so much about this movie that is like, even from the directing, like who knows if these elements were in the script or not, but there's like a lot of nice subtleties, like the, the scene where they're out drinking the at the carrot juice bar or whatever. And it doesn't really, mm. it does, we don't mm. get a close up of this. We we're just able to notice it, but you know, the scene starts and we see that uh, Lester's, finished his carrot juice and John Cusack's character has like not even touched it before he leaves even though there's been like plenty of passage of time I love little details like that and Mm -hmm. um, it adds to the character it adds to the scene it adds to the context 
Yeah, he definitely has a, a a special lens that he presents his stories through. He's clearly very intelligent and very empathetic. Yeah, very thoughtful, very yeah, creative. Yeah. His ideas are so meta, <laughs> and <laughs> he understands people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, clearly. I mean, to 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 some degree, yeah. Uh, there. I mean, we even get that through uh, some of the writing of dialogue, like just the awkwardness of how John Cusack's character is played in the first third of the film. There's mm. there's scenes where it's so delightfully awkward, but not in a like weird kind of like. Not not in kind of like a stereotypical Judd Apatow comedy awkward kind of way, but in, in a Coen Brothers-esque kind of way where it's yeah, like, okay, yeah. I don't know how you wrote that. You must have just heard someone say it. Like this must have been plucked from real life or something because no one would <laughs> yeah. think of that, but it still seems natural the way it's said. Like uh, when he was, uh, the way he was phrasing his conversation when he was trying to talk to Maxime for one of the first times, like... Oh, I work at this place. Where where are you starting to work? Just like the way it was phrased, just these weird little details where it's like, okay, you're delightfully awkward, but who can write that? You know, it's like it's a weird writing challenge in a way to like actually get yourself in the mind of a character who would talk like that or say something like mm -hmm. that, where it's not mm -hmm. like a typical thing that anyone would ever say. There's a detail that I really enjoyed of like him literally playing a tape recording of an audience cheering which is just a very succinct kind of like neat way of, of introducing his goals and motivations as a character, which obviously comes back into play later. Like he wants to be famous for this, this sort of thing. Yeah. And that in of itself, like not the most incredibly unique or creative idea, but it's a, just a nice little thing so that we don't have to be beaten over the head with it, I guess. It, it perfectly establishes it right away. And that's very important in terms of writing is getting the basics covered, which is why Artemis Fowl was such a shit movie is because there are things <laughs> happening in that film that are just like, you know, scenes of exposition where they could be plucked out of any other movie, but they didn't cover the basics first. So nobody gives a shit about anything that's happening. Like you didn't cover the yeah, basics. Yeah, contextualize right? You got to get yeah. you got to get those out of the way in the, the first part of the movie so that people care about what's going on. I have one <laughs> tiny little nitpicky criticism about the presentation of the film, uh, and it's within mm. that scene where we first get into Malkovich's head, is the mirror is the shot. Mirror. Yeah. yeah, Because you can tell it's at yeah, an angle, it. whereas if, perhaps if they had a higher budget, they could have built a set where the mirror was just pointing to a mirrored version of the same set behind it, and had Malkovich just walk in yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. That so good. that would have been a fix. But again, it's like, it's that. so minor that it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. yeah yeah but other movies have done that well yeah less money that was much later i think mm -hmm. into the void but yeah yeah this is nitpicking <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, I'm, just, I'm just mentioning yeah. it because i yeah. would mention it in any other movie i guess i love the line <laughs> like there's so many great comedic moments like uh I don't understand how I could go on living my life the way I lived it before. And Maxine just gestures towards the window, the open window, like fucking kill yourself. <laughs> like <laughs> so good. Her character is just so awful. But I mean, all the characters are kind of fucking awful in this movie. The main character is yeah, just a it's piece kind of, of shit. Point. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's an yeah, asshole. He is. He's very unlikable. They're monsters. That's the whole point. The line where uh, they're at the house of of Lester. And he's saying, okay, enter the fifth door on my left. And then she gets confused mm -hmm. and goes through the wrong room. There's so many other films, so many other television shows. Like, it's a common trope of like, oh, I'm looking for the bathroom, but I accidentally enter another room sort of thing. Like, that's a very common yeah. thing. But the way that it's set up in terms of just that simple line, enter the fifth door on my left. He's already such a quirky, weird character that it's like, you just imagine that's something that he would say and you wouldn't correct mm -hmm. him because it's just like, okay, well, this guy, uh, whatever, he's fucking weird. But that mm -hmm. alone, those directions, it's like, what does that mean at the same time? And so you can totally understand why someone would get so confused. It's not just like, oh, yeah, I, I show up and there's too many doors sort of thing like it happens in so many other stories. Yeah. There's like a, a logical reason in the writing for why that would happen. <laughs> There's just so much in terms of like, I already explained Maxine's motivation and how that 
plays into her and how you can tell basically from the moment she's entered into the story. Uh, but I love as soon as Maxine meets Lottie, you see this grin on her face and immediately you can tell like she's she's thinking like I can use this and everything just yeah. adds so much into these these characters motivations and especially when she's like let her go Craig I mean him and she sees that as a way she's like okay I'm going to not misgender you and I'm going to see you for your mm -hmm. true self and I will be able to manipulate you more because of that and I'll also be able to ma manipulate Craig more because of that every bit of conversation like when they smoke weed and she starts saying like she literally starts talking about the virtue of people going after what they want so they don't regret their lives and that not mm. only plays into her as a character but that is a, a very clear way where she is seeing how she can manipulate someone else and she's literally just suggesting making enhanced suggestibility for lottie's character basically telling her what to do but pretending as though she's just being philosophical it's very slimy mm -hmm. i love when malkovich finds out that all of this is going on mm -hmm. and he says i will see you in court and yeah. from that moment all i'm thinking <laughs> is like if that happened that would be so funny just imagining what <laughs> a courtroom would be like of like they got in my head and they were selling tickets to my brain <laughs> just how goofy that would be it's just so well done from like a parody level like it seems really genuine like it could be a real thing and on the mm -hmm. uh criterion blu-ray and the special features they basically included that full sequence without cutting back to the characters like you could just watch it as if it were a video sort of thing oh that's cool oh cool and i don't know Maybe this was just easier to pick up on watching this way. Perhaps it cut to another character in the film, and that's why I didn't notice it. But when they talk about his uh, Malkovich's breakout puppeteering performance at the Grammys, I think, whichever, or the Emmys, whichever one it was, they talk about his performance, and they say that his act was he was manipulating a marionette that was also manipulating a smaller marionette. So basically, you see the shot of Malkovich uh, holding a puppet, and then the puppet pulls another puppet out of a box. And <laughs> I, I, I wish that they had made that more clear in the film, because I think they cut away from that moment. Because watching that in the featurette, all I'm thinking is like, that's exactly what is happening in the story, too. Because John Cusack's character is puppeteering Malkovich, who is puppeteering a puppet. So it, there already is that extra layer. And so th if you think about it, it's it's like a third layer rather than just a second layer. And it's just, it's so crazy. It's like the, the fucking, uh, the warehouse in Synecdoche, New York, where they build New York inside of New York. Yeah. There's a just so many layers mm -hmm. yeah. and it just loops on forever. I mean, obvi th this is like a, a no brainer, but I love how meta the film is. Because it's, it's <laughs> yes. not just a movie that's about writing. It's a movie about writing the movie that you're watching. And it's, it's so... Funny. Yes. When, when it starts getting into the point where he's writing the actual film you're watching... Yeah, and he's, we're writing, yeah. he's writing scenes we're watching like, yeah. play out. Recording <laughs> that's it's very where, funny. Yeah, what he's saying, yeah, what he's saying repeated. It's so energetic and it's so much fun just to think uh -huh. about. Although there are kind of more subtle instances of that same thing uh -huh. happening because near the beginning of the film one of the lines when he's uh starting to write even though he's not talking about the film that he's currently write or or the version of the script that is in the film he's one of the lines is okay so i need to establish the themes and that's as the themes are being established in the film so it's kind of also <laughs> meta mm -hmm. in that sense yeah i i, I love the the pitch of Donald Kaufman's script. I love I love just how like cliched and just like you know, it's the type of thing that could sell, you know, realistically, especially yeah. in the early two thousands. Where he's just like, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a serial killer <laughs> and it turns out that it's actually him the whole time and it's a split personality. <laughs> and what's really funny about this is like they, they directly mention the contradiction that would arise from uh if there are all these characters and there's like a chase scene, then, you know, where both of the vehicles coming from. So how can he be in two places at once? And he's just like, yeah, well, I don't know. It's 
subversive like like just kind of explaining <laughs> it away and then the very next year another film came out where i guess i won't say the title because it's a spoiler for the movie but a horror film by a french director and that enough should give it away uh <laughs> that that did that exact same thing and i like the movie but like holy crap that that gigantic plot hole just like kind of ruins the oh, wow. the movie <laughs> so much that roger ebert even mentioned it in his review he he, he said That's there's fun. a plot hole so big you could drive a truck through it so <laughs> charlie kaufman strikes me as a very lovesick person because i realized while watching this mm -hmm. film that every single one of his movies essentially has a character longing for like an important sort of like intimacy with another character. Yeah. So that makes me yeah, kind of sad. Cool. Like, <laughs> a bit tortured. I feel bad for the guy. Because it's like, it's <laughs> it, from what I can tell, it's like clearly a part of him, right? It's like, yeah, it's just, it's really just one of the. Yeah. It, it's hard it's... to know like exactly where the characters end and he starts. Yeah, exactly. But, like, but there's, there's just so yeah, much of him very in these, these movies. Like, you mm -hmm. can tell he it's is so literally personal. in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed adaptation. There's like little bits of uh, details here and there that I picked up on this time. Like uh, him saying like before he goes into the meeting pretending to be his brother, he's like, don't laugh how you laugh. And then immediate cut to mm -hmm. him laughing, which I found kind of funny. <laughs> but it wasn't like yeah, so yeah, but... overt. It wasn't so obvious that it was like the punchline, but it was just a, a nice little yeah. detail. Yeah, they always reel it back. They don't go over the top with the ideas. It's mm -hmm. very subtle. Spike Jones makes both of these really great too i love that yeah. charlie kaufman yeah. is able to work with great directors now he's directing his own things which is just even better but it was really crucial for his ideas to work to actually collaborate with talented mm -hmm. people that could bring his vision to life so both spike jones and michelle gondry like if you had directors that were not as competent these ideas would never work that well like they wouldn't be the same films at all so much of it is the directing too even though i'm like obviously you know gushing over charlie kaufman you got to give credit to spike jones for both of these films yeah 